1925, Georg Brandes published a book, Savnet om Jesus, in English, Jesus, a Myth. It was followed by a small book on Peter and one on early Christianity or original Christianity, Urkristendom, 1927. In, this, in these books, Brandes argued that Jesus was a myth. He concluded his research with the words that when I write this, my sole motivation is duty and virtue, something that is being suppressed by hypocrites nowadays. And it is only due to the suppression that all their success uh, depends. They have no sense of truth. They have no love of truth. Now, the work of uh, Brandes was met uh, with almost total silence. As Brandes says, I, shared, I seem to share the fate of uh, Jesus. It was as if I had never existed. That was his main argument. Brandes was certainly well read in the sources, and the most characteristic feature of his three books is simply his common sense. There was no reaction. One would have expected historians or philologists, historians of religion, to reply or take place, participate in the, the debate. That did not happen, however, and the theologians simply ignored him. Now, if we go to 1998, I myself published a book where I showed Buddhist sources of Christianity, something that Brandes had not been aware of, but I'm sure he would have been delighted had he known of these Buddhist sources. Here again, there was an outcry, not total silence, but an outcry and a demand that my books, my book here be banned. It almost was banned, 23 teachers from various universities, mainly so-called historians of religion, tried their best to have the books banned and, of course, slandered my name and so on and so forth. Much the same situation that Brandes had experienced in the 20s or even much earlier because Brandes, the key to understand Brandes, I think, is to take him on his word that he is a free thinker. Now, free thinker did not in those days mean that he was willing to think or do almost anything freely. No, no. He makes it very clear that what he is against is what he is against and opposed to is the biblical superstition that was characteristic of Denmark in the 19th or the second half of the 19th century. In a certain way, the situation has not changed. This I experienced in 1998 when I published a book where there are Buddhist sources. Not one theologian not one of the many persons who demanded uh, the book being banned had competence or expertise in or qualification in the Buddhist languages, Sanskrit and Pali. So this was typical. People were uh, very much disturbed, not really knowing what they were disturbed about, not competent really to have an opinion. So this was in 98. Now we are in uh, the year 2014 and we are in Neum, in Neum Church. This was an extraordinary situation. The Bishop of Copenhagen, who is, so to say, the top man within the Lutheran tradition in Denmark. He's the, the leading authority in matters of orthodoxy, and that is Lutheran orthodoxy. Since the Reformation in 1536, Danes are Lutherans, supposed to be. There's a minority of Catholics and others, but he's the big shot. I was so fortunate to be there and uh, to meet Bishop Peter on his way to the church, and I told him a little about my background and uh, what I wanted to ask him about uh, during um, when there was a possibility to do so after his presentation in the church. He was going to answer the question, what's the use of the Bible? What can we use our Bible for? And I wanted to be polite, of course, and s sort of to warn him that I wanted to ask him about Buddhist sources. Quite honestly, he said to me, I never heard about Buddhist sources. That's okay, I'll explain. Good. And then Peter spoke uh, for 40 minutes or so, and the main point of Peter's 
uh, presentation was that the very heart of Christianity is resurrection. If there were no resurrection, there would be no faith. You almost can feel this is a quotation from 1 Corinthians 15. So Peter referred to three sources of resurrection. Uh, there was the Emmaus episode, where the resurrected Jesus was met and witnessed. And there was the episode of the empty tomb, the woman at the empty tomb. And there was the story of the more than 500 brothers and Cephas and others uh, present at the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul being the person who says that according to the scriptures and so on, there were these witnesses, more than 500 brothers. And this was the foundation of our faith, Peter said. And of course, this was not just Peter's opinion. It was exactly the opinion that any bishop from 1536 would also have expressed when he talked to the audience, when he addressed the audience. No doubt about that. And I felt, therefore, that it was my duty and my a matter of virtue uh, to uh, raise my finger and ask Peter for the sources of these sources. So we have these three main sources that form the foundation of belief in the resurrection of Christ or Jesus. And I wanted to ask the question, Peter, what are the sources of these sources? Peter had said we should be honest and seek truths. So I, I had no bad conscience in asking him this. Det helt centrale, som også Paulus siger til videre. Der kunne jeg godt tænke mig at rejse spørgsmålet, som også er blevet forsøgt. Kilderne til opstandelsen. Du kan selv være opmærksom på, hvor vanskeligt det er at sige noget i en tid om biblen. Men hvis vi blot holder os til første point, der var det 15. Der var de mere end 500 brødre, og det er jo hovedpunktet. Det er jo alle sammen lige om første del til biblen. Og så måske den tomme grav for mig mere til stede. Så kommer spørgsmålet. Det er faktisk muligt med kilderne. Nu tænkte jeg godt sammen, før vi gik ind i kirken her der. Og i hvert for 30 år, har studeret med de buddhistiske kilder til det nye testament. Der har vi historien i første kompreherbrev 15, med de mere end 500 brødre, hvor er nogen er døde, og andre steder lever, siger Paulus. Og hvis ikke vi kan forlade os på det, de siger, så er vores tro fra Kajne Hedvist Der er altså en buddhistisk kilde, og da du med rejde fremhæver, øh, eller at vi skal være søge sandhed, så synes jeg også, at jeg burde have mod til at nævne, at vi bliver nødt til at kigge på kilderne for til. Det er den ene kilde. Den er trygt. Det er ikke noget, jeg fikker. Den er trygt, og den er brugt professor Lockwood, Emeritus i Sanskrit og kristendom fra øh, Madras Christian College og øh, Madras University. Den kan tås lidt via Amazon. Og den anden kilder, jeg bliver nødt til at sige det, fordi sådan er den tomme grav og Maria. Den buddhistiske historie er kendt af alle buddhister. Det er en ung mand, der hedder Yashas, og så ligesom Jesus. Hun kommer om morgenen til hans tomme seng og bliver beskyttet, løber hen til kongen, han er kongen, så ligesom Jesus, der hjælper sig også. Kongen står i sig. Og så fortsætter historien. Og det er kun sådan, som Vores præst sagde før, at der er tale om en mundtlig Nej, der er tale om afskrift. Ikke mundtlig overhovedet i dag, men afskrift. Akkurat, som vi kan se, hvis vi tager, lad os sige, en sprogtil til bilen og en dansk sprogtil til bilen. Så kan vi se, at der er sådan en originalt spørgsmål. Så kan vi se, at der ikke taler om mundtlig flydende overhovedet. Nej, nej, der er tale om afskrift. For at citere sit ord, og på gør det sundt, der er tale om afskrift. Det var i at tage et fedt, det jeg vil sige, og det er mere end en kommentar, må undskylde, men øh, vi skal jo prøve at være ærlige, og jeg har hedder mit vind. Tak. Har du nogen til det, som jeg gør? Ja, det gør jeg. Det er mig. Og når jeg siger, at det med, jeg siger ikke sådan helt, at for mig er rigtig kina, det var absolut ikke uinteressant. Men det er ikke den, jeg tror på som sådan, det er en evne, som Peter også var, var inde på. Og som Søren Kierkegaard, han også øh, sagde, øh, havde ledet ret op af, af livet, øh, så var det som et heller ikke en lidt mistændere at være kommet til tro, end det er i dag, i det er alle kilderne på første, anden og tredje, og fjerde hånd, altså at der er en på første hånd eller på anden hånd. 
spørgsmålet, hvad budskabet vigter på, for at komme ud over problemet, om der taler om et fantasibillede eller om et realbillede. Du kan ikke være andet, det er jo så subjektivt, så kan du ja, ja. bare vælge modsat. Vi har også lige et, et spørgsmål her, Peter. Ja, det er en henvisning til den der, og Johannes Evangel, kapitel 1, der er en radio, der er en bindbøge, hvor Jesus det simpelthen de spørger ham, om det er ham selv, eller hans forældre, der har søn, som er født med. Og så, så svarer Jesus bagefter, at det er nogen af dem. Så tænker jeg lidt på, om man kan skrive, hvor man egentlig kan skrive, hvor man egentlig kan skrive, Det er kun jødeskild. Men jeg havde det der ikke ja, ja, ja. ja. So let me try to sum up. We have been listening to the bishop of Copenhagen, the highest authority in matters of Lutheran orthodoxy. Peter made it very clear that the foundation of Christianity rests on the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ was not resurrected, then there was no there would be no Christianity, and there were three sources pointing out for for this resurrection. Uh, now, I pointed out that uh, there are, in fact, Buddhist sources. Peter said that he had never heard of such sources. I pointed out the sources, and Peter also said that he did not want to hear about these sources. He had no time, as he said. At this point, the local priest came into the picture and tried to say, well, perhaps the sources are not all that important. What is important is your personal conviction, which is a plain absurdity, of course, because then you might be convinced of anything. If you're only, if what counts is your personal conviction, then there are thousands of ways to understand the situation. No, you must be honest and see that facts come first and then comes faith. It's not faith that determine what facts are. This is plain. But Peter and the local priest are, of course, typical of the situation. I have tried very often to speak to bishops and professors of theology. The situation is the same. We do not want to hear this. It was exactly the same in the case of Brandes. I've just reading, been reading a book about 600 pages of the history of theology in Denmark, and Brandes' name and his three works that I mentioned first, Jesus a myth, that Jesus does not exist, is being completely ignored. Now, perhaps just a word about what we are dealing with. On the whole, I would characterize the New Testament as Buddhist propaganda. It's a collection of Buddhist stories. The idea that a savior dies for our sake is very common in Buddhist fairy tales. It's been taken over. Somewhere on the net you'll find Professor Derrett, who has written this very, very important book about the Bible and the Buddhist, 
telling us that that's the core of Christianity. A savior sacrificing his own life for our benefit, and as Professor Derrick says, this is a very common Buddhist uh, motive. It's a fable. It's a story. So there we are, on the one hand, scholarship, and then on the other hand, all these theologians making a good living from telling stories, Buddhist stories. Uh, it's an untenable situation. And uh, I can only do, I can only see that even those scholars are timid and uh, are almost being uh, uh, being driven out. Um, still, they have to be responsible and uh, try to think, that, try to understand that there is something called truth and there is something called duty. The facts, <laughs> the facts have a difficult, uh, difficult situation. They're being suppressed, but uh, they are there, and it's uh, a very interesting thing to take this up. Very interesting and uh, important thing to be done. I'm referring you then to a few titles, Professor Derrick and the works of Professor Lockwood. And there's also an excellent book by Professor Fundy. Typically, it would be veteran scholars who have retired and do not risk too much who come up and dare to say that the New Testament is based on Buddhist sources. I hope you'll enjoy the research ahead of us.